Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? My voice is trashed, in case you hadn't noticed. I published a little health update at shadowpublications.com if you want all the skinny, but at the moment, the docs are blaming allergies for my voice. If it's not better by the end of the weekend, I'll be visiting my ENT for a second opinion. The only other real item of note is to remind you that the Black 2nd Edition is coming at you like a freight train. The new edition will go on sale July 1st, unless something catastrophic happens, but considering it's Amazon, anything's possible. Hopefully the audiobook will be available the same day from Audible. More on that when we get closer to the date. With that, I'm going to go gargle with salt water, take a huff from my inhaler, and go write some more Oceania. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's Episode 7 of Station 3. Chapter 7 Reiki beckoned the nearest medtech over while Zilf made his way to block off any attempt at a retreat to the surgery, freezer, or exam room. She hadn't had to say anything. You run enough drills and you know what to do, what to expect, when to ask questions, and when to hunt. She muted both Zilf and Griggs, but had kept her own comms open. Hannah, I need to speak with your team. Um, okay, the short med tech said. Zilf could tell from the tech's body language that she was ready to collapse. By the sound of her voice, he guessed she hadn't slept in at least a day, maybe more. What had Ramirez said? He hadn't slept in two days? When Zilf got a chance, he'd ask Recky about that. Who was Ramirez? And why had he lied about what was in the barracks? If he was infected, why hadn't they left him behind? The woman named Hannah cocked her head as if she were listening. Her external speakers were muted, so it was impossible to hear what she was saying, although he was willing to bet money that Recky knew. She'd probably crack their comms first chance she got. The fact the rest of the team didn't have access? SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. The crew might know something classified the EETs weren't cleared for. They were going to have to communicate with the med techs via their external comms rather than the internal ones. Going to be loud, he thought. A boom sounded from the foyer. Zilf flinched slightly, barely enough for anyone to notice while encased in the armor. He turned in that direction, his mic going active. Griggs? Yeah, his squad mate said over the shared channel. I think he came from the airlock. That's impossible, Zilf said. No way into that. It's shut tight. Griggs took a deep breath. I know that, he said, his patience wearing a little thin. I mean from the other side, the lift side. Even if you ignored the fact someone had gotten into the lift shaft, managed to reach the lift and the airlock entrance, what could they possibly be hitting the steel with to make that loud of a sound? A patient on the table nearest Zilf twitched, shook, and sat up. He turned his head and saw a clump of long hair fall off the man's deteriorating scalp. Hungry, the man said. The medtech nearest Zilf stiffened before turning to the patient. You hungry, Amir? Amir nodded and brushed away a stray lock of filthy, crusted hair that fell out as soon as he touched it. The man's sallow, jaundiced skin quivered like jelly as though threatening to slough off the bone. Zilf fought through a dry wretch, his torch pointing back at the floor. He suddenly understood why command wanted this area abandoned. They couldn't afford to let a single person out of here unless they wanted to risk infecting the last of the survivors of Station 1, and possibly the EET. The medtech glanced in Zilf's direction, either silently asking him for permission or guidance, but he was still trying to wrap his head around the fact this man appeared to be melting. The green-suited tech walked to a mirror. Apart from hungry, how are you feeling? The tech pulled a scanner from the belt. Amir rubbed a hand across his feverish forehead, layers of flesh bunching against his fingers as though they were putty knives. Hungry, thirsty, the man said in a barely intelligible rasp. He raised an arm toward the tech. The tech instinctively reached for Amir's hand, perhaps to hold it and comfort him, or maybe to lay him back down. Zilf watched with dreamy horror as Amir's extended hand clamped down on the tech's forearm and pulled hard. The tech stumbled forward, their helmeted head landing on Amir's chest. Amir opened his mouth, leaned back, and then pistoned forward, jaw snapping shut on the flexible material just below the helmet collar. A surprised shriek squealed out of the tech's external speakers before a spray of blood erupted from their neck. 
Amir pulling back with a chunk of flesh and suit grinding between his jaws. Shark eats. Zilf raised the torch, set it to a narrow focus, and activated the plasma tool. A 20-degree cone of blue flame jetted from the tool, the particles colliding with the mirror, the tech, and the examination table all at once. The tech's suit immediately caught fire, as did everything on the table. Amir's remaining hair vaporized, the yellowish flesh of his scalp melting off his skull. Zilf deactivated the tool, the tip glowing like a dying star. The tech's shriek had died long ago with fried electronics, seared or charred vocal cords, and lungs. The way the body slumped told him the tech was dead. Amir, on the other hand, was still moving. The man's skin was all but gone, exposing reddish muscles striated with irregular, meandering lines of green. Amir, still on fire, crunched it down on the tech's exposed trachea, his hands now ripping and tearing at the remains of the suit as if he were digging for bones, which he was. Griggs, grab your tech. Zilf, take him out. Zilf quickly walked to the table, his mind barely aware there were other sounds in the room now. Griggs was shouting, someone was screaming, and Amir was still eating, his head now buried in the exposed ribcage. Zilf pulled back an armored arm before launching it forward in a smooth, quick motion. The armored fist struck Amir at the back of his skull with the sound of ice cracking. The burning man twirled off the table like a child's toy, shards of fractured skull peppering the floor. Amir struck the bulkhead with a wet thump, his arms still flailing. Zelf, grab a tech, Reki yelled. He turned as quickly as he could, eyes scanning for green suits. One of the techs had flattened themselves against the bulkhead, apparently too terrified to move. Zilf quickly closed the distance, slowing at the last moment and gently turning at the same time. His massive fist slid past the tech's hip before curling and lifting. The tech, probably screaming in pain, shock, and fear, ended up clutched to his chest as Zilf kept moving. Just hold on, he said through the external speakers, more than likely blasting out the tech's eardrums to boot. Reiki had another tech by the shoulder and was pushing them toward the emergency exit. Zilf followed, his charge still keening like an air raid siren. The emergency exit opened for them. Reki ran inside after letting go of Hannah. Clear, she yelled a second later. Zilf nudged Hannah to go into the corridor beyond the hatch. The tech complied but stumbled with nervous fear. Once beyond the hatchway, Zilf gently lowered his cargo to the deck. The tech lurched away from him, Hannah quickly moving to keep her colleague from hitting the deck. Help Griggs, Reki said. Torch anything not wearing green. Shark eats. Zilf wordlessly turned and headed back through the hatch. Two of the patients that had been on the floor, no doubt dying or near death just a few minutes ago, had risen from their makeshift beds. They muttered and mumbled, slowly turning in place as if searching for something. Help me! One of them wheezed as it stumbled toward him. Zilf watched in horror as the left side of its cheek caved in, liquefied skin falling through the hole and into the patient's mouth, where it drooled out of the side of their lips. Help? Zilf pressed forward and met the ill human without breaking stride. Trying to be as gentle as possible, he moved his arm to the side just as the sensors told him he'd met flesh, and pushed. The body fell aside with a squelch, Zilf continuing to the foyer and Griggs. The remaining ill that had reached their feet appeared confused and barely able to maintain their balance. Not much of a threat to an EET unless they found weapons they could use. Considering the medbay's inventory, he didn't think that was going to be a problem. He passed a zippered body bag and nearly halted in mid-step. It was one of the codes he'd been told to move, a dead person just taking up space in the medbay. Only they weren't dead. The bag rippled as the fingers struggled to find purchase against the slick material. Zelf! Griggs yelled over the comms. He moved past the crinkling, writhing body bag and stepped through the hatch into the foyer. Griggs stood near the disabled airlock, his rifle held in one hand, a med tech in the other. The patients that had been on stretchers had all risen from their beds. The sallow-looking thing that had once lay on the credenza smiled at him with a lipless mouth. The trio of ill had all left their temporary beds and stood in a triangle blocking Griggs from reaching the door. Zilf didn't wait for an explanation. Move, he said over the external speakers, and took three loud clunking steps into the middle of the foyer. 
The ill turned as one toward him, their features looking more and more distorted. One of them said something, but Zilf couldn't understand the words. The man's jaw dropped nearly to his chest, the muscles and ligaments holding it in place apparently sliced or dissolved. The man stumbled, hands reaching for Zilf. Like a running back throwing a block, Zilf leaned slightly and pushed hard. The tactile sensors gave him the sensation of touching hot, slimy flesh as the human fell back, head hitting the deck like a rotten melon. Zilf pivoted and took a step toward another. The assailant, what had once been a woman, had seen what he'd done to her compatriot and tried to move out of his range. He swung his other arm and struck her at the shoulder. She spun and twirled before meeting the bulkhead, the kindling snap of bone echoing the tall foyer. The last of the would-be assailants simply stared at him, its roomy eyes regarding him with hate, or maybe hungry, it said. Bright, manic light flashed in its dying eyes, its mouth moving as it ground its teeth together. It spun and rushed at Griggs, hands outreached for his charge. Zilf had to move faster than he'd expected to catch the human by the neck. He closed his fist and flung the body to the opposite bulkhead. The rag doll flew through the air, legs and arms flailing, before striking steel. Cover! Griggs yelled at him and lifted the tech with both arms. He ran through the hatch, expertly sliding into the medical bay. Zilf dared any of the bodies to so much as twitch, but none did except for the body bag in the corner, that was. It rippled as the others had, unseen fingers rubbing against their prison of synthetic material. Clear! Griggs yelled. Shark swims. Zilf ran to the hatchway leading to the medical bay. Once beyond the threshold, he ran to the emergency exit. Just as he was moving into the corridor, his external mics picked up a boom. He slowed and peered back, eyes flicking from the exam room door to the freezer and then to the surgery. Two seconds ticked off. Then he saw it. A dimple had formed in the freezer's metal door. A dimple puckered and the sound echoed through the room again. Self! Recky shouted. He turned back to the corridor and ran, his eyes flicking to his rear cam. Just before losing line of sight, he saw something puncture the dimple. He swung his gaze forward and focused on the open hatch. Recky stood several meters from the opening, her plasma cannon pointed near the deck, but not quite at it. Griggs, standing just to the side to provide immediate cover, held his weapon in the same position. They'd apparently cleared the tech out of Zilf's way. He crossed the threshold and the hatch shut behind him. The 7x7 cube suddenly bathed in bright, white light. Panting, Zilf turned to Recky. What's going on? Yeah, Griggs said. Zilf could practically hear the anger in his voice. We could have handled that a bit better. Orders are orders, she said. Whether we like them, understand them, or... Her voice became a savage whisper. Agree with them. Zilf flinched. He hadn't heard Recky ever sound like that under stress. Then again, they'd never had to inflict non-combatant civilian casualties before. He swallowed hard and imagined what his father might say. To this, there was only a mental shrug. We have three survivors, she said. We need to get them back to Deck 1 and to Li Zhao. She and Yuri can use their help and also keep an eye on them. Griggs took a deep breath before slowly and loudly exhaling. Okay, boss. So what's next? She forwarded a schematic to their HUDs. It rotated slightly before splitting into a flat level-by-level -level diagram. This is an emergency airlock. We're going to lead the text to the next level. There's a junction where we can get back to the dock module, Reiki said. Lines appeared on his HUD, tracing the route. 300 meters to get back to Li Zhao, Yuri, and the space elevator, their only way to escape this strange station. Zilf used his eyes to rotate the model slightly and get more perspective. The lines on the path were hardly straight when put into context. Instead, they bent and followed what he assumed was the module's external frame, maybe even through its attachments to rock or ice or whatever held it in place. When he inspected the junction, he found it to be nearly 50 meters in height. The modules, the lift, this made sense. The modules for Station 1 were stacked atop one another, yes, but also more like stair steps, each module connected to the one above. What Zilf wouldn't give to see how this facility was attached to the ice, or perhaps the rock lying beneath the ice. Without a detailed map of the area, however, the only way to know would be to open a hatch to the ocean, climb out, 
and fall through the water to the bottom, gently adjusting his trajectory to follow the stairs. What would he see? Nothing. Griggs, Recky said, breaking Zul's train of thought. You're going to clear the next area. Make sure there's nothing in our way. Her external speakers came to life. Listen up. We're going to get you back to our redoubt. Has anyone traveled this area before? The techs looked at one another, but none raised their hands. As I thought, Recky said. We're going to open this airlock and make our way to a module junction. I need you to be calm, follow our orders, and we'll get you to safety. Any questions? The techs were quiet again, but were no longer glancing at one another. Zilf imagined the trio were conversing on their own frequency, when he wasn't supposed to be listening in on regardless of how easy it would be. His comms toolkit provided plenty of means to find and hack most encryption schemes. The only thing keeping him from doing it was policy and standing orders. Finally, the techs shook their heads. Recky nodded to them. I'm going to open the airlock now, she said, both through the external speakers as well as over the squad channel.